Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Apes screencast with your Apes teacher, Mr. Stano. And today we're going to look at science systems, matter and energy, basically a little overview of kind of how the scientific process work, uh, some different systems as far as um, uh, energy and matter, uh, just to kind of get a brief overview. This is some of the stuff that we need to know before we really get into more in depth other topics within the environmental sciences. So uh, we can learn something from Easter Island. Easter Island, a uh, very remote island, uh, it had a thriving society of about 15,000 people uh, in about 1,400. But what ended up happening is through the Polynesian rat uh, species that was introduced there, uh, over-resource use and overpopulation, they basically caused their civilization, civilization to collapse. And what we could do is we can kind of learn from the lessons there, that very small isolated island, and apply them to the bigger picture. So what do we do? How can we learn from those mistakes? Well, what do scientists do? They basically can ask a question, then they do experiments and kind of collect data. And from that, they kind of form ideas as to how the data or the experiment worked. And then what they'll do is they'll go back and recollect more data. They'll test that hypothesis, uh, revise it, either negate it or, you know, kind of say, yeah, it worked a little bit, and then um, basically turn it into a theory. They can go back at any point to interpret data maybe differently or recollect data and or have other people go and try to do the experiment over to really kind of see if what they did or if their hypothesis proved to be useful in some sort of way. Uh, we can then take this and basically put this into a scientific paper. And at that point, we have peers review it or a, a body of uh, people to review it. And they'll either accept what happened in that paper or reject it. If it's rejected, they'll have to go back. The author will have to go back, rework that paper, or even rework their hypothesis, uh, rework any portion of that, that process that we went over before until it's accepted. And at that point, it can be, uh, it can be published in a journal and it's evaluated by the rest of the community and it becomes now something that, uh, information that's something that others can use to help work their scientific theory or process. Uh, there's a number of different things in testing hypothesis. One of them is the variables or factors that influence what's going on. That's really what we're trying to control in these experiments. Single variable experiments, are pretty easy to kind of run. We know, or what we think we know and have down to narrow down to one variable affecting what's happening. But what we see in the environmental sciences is that things are multivariable. There's other things going on within experiments or within nature that, that sometimes are seen or unforeseen that will tell us what's happening or affect what's happening. Multivariable experiments are hard to are hard to control, and they're kind of hard to really simulate. But so what we do is we'll take those multivariables and we'll break them down into several single variable experiments to try to figure out what's going on in a system. Uh, we can use inductive reasoning, uh, basically using specific observations to get a conclusion about a hypothesis, or we could use bottom up reasoning, was basically going from very specific. To broadening out to what's happening versus our deductive reasoning uh, which is using logic to arrive at a specific conclusion and the top down is the exact is the opposite of the bottom up which is going from general and then narrowing down to very specific causalities of of processes here I'm going to start with the junk science it's basically science that hasn't gone through any real process and no real peer review. This is sometimes used, or we see this used in politics a lot, where it's used, to, it's thrown out there with the ability to help refute what's actually sound science or science that has gone through um, a series of experiments and has been peer reviewed and also been accepted by exper uh, experts. That junk science really kind of throws a monkey wrench into sound science and is uh, it's used and it's out there. And frontier science has not been widely tested, it's starting a point of peer review. So it's kind of like it's new and it's out there, but it hasn't it's it hasn't undergone the test that we have seen with sound science. The problem, like I said, with environmental science 
is first of all, we may not have a huge understanding of what is going on. So what happens is with that very that very small understanding that we have, we may oversee variables that are affecting systems. And what ends up happening is sometimes these results can be controversial because we don't know everything that's going on. Um, like I said, we could try to break it down and use models to help us out with that. Models, uh, we use them, uh, we see them with weather all the time. Meteorologists use a number of different models to kind of predict weather systems or things that are happening in our environment. And they're just real simplifi simplifications of what's happening in real life. And we'll use a number of them in class. Um, and like we said, we can use to produce, produce or predict, sorry, if-then scenarios. Feedback loops. Now, moving away from the scientific theory and how we come at it, are really important in environmental science. Basically, we have a number of different types of feedback loops, positive and feed, uh, negative feedback loops. And we experience these every single day, and you may not even know it. Positive feedback loops cause a system to go change further in the same direction. So the example we can give is erosion, such as, um, as beach erosion. So what ends up happening is, is we have a small amount of sediment move and then over time maybe more sediment removes and more and more. So we'll see this furthering effect. It could also happen backwards too where there's a change and then it becomes a smaller change and smaller and smaller. So whatever the direction is happening, whether something becomes more or exasperated or less and less, that's a positive feedback. Negative feedback loops where there's a change that occurs and then all of a sudden, an opposite change happens in response. Uh, one example that is pretty easy to understand is with humans. When we sweat, we sweat because we're hot. Then what happens is the water droplets on our skin evaporate and the temperature cools. So that's a, And then we feel cooler. So that's a negative feedback loop. We have a change in one direction, which causes an opposite effect. Uh, Thermo, you know, uh, thermostats in your house are also another example of a negative feedback loop. You turn the heat on to uh, 70 degrees and the house will heat up till 70 degrees. Once it hits that threshold, it stops until the house cools down again. And then another threshold is hit, heat kicks on. So those are just more examples and we'll go over uh, more, than, more of those in class. Uh, like I said, negative feedback loops um, cause that, uh, you know, that opposite uh, effect. Uh, they can take a long time to occur and you know it's just something that happens in nature processes and feedbacks in the system can have synergistic effects and in synergistic effect what we see is an amplification of the results so smoking exasperates the effect of asbestos on um, lung cancer so we know that asbestos can, go, can cause lung cancer and so can smoking combine them now they're increasing that chance of possibly getting lung cancer. Okay, we're gonna stop here uh, before we go into types and structure of matter because this moves forward into a little bit of pollution. So I hope you enjoyed this screencast, real basic kind of just brief overview of scientific theory and just a couple of different feedback loops that we may have, uh, will be encountering. I hope you enjoyed it, take care.